Uh, so hello, my name is Taku Kamabi. I'm a freelance photographer here in Toronto, and I just wanted to thank uh, Nikon Canada for allowing me to come here and present to you uh, my presentation on photography. Uh, today I'm here to talk to you about shifting perspectives for a new look. And uh, well, what does that mean, you may ask. Uh, I don't mean using a tilt shift lens or any special uh, lenses that uh, you may have in your photography gear, but this is something that many people or pretty much anybody can do with their um, cameras, whether they have a DSLR or using their uh, mobile phones as well. So it's basically any tips and uh, techniques that I hope uh, people will take into their arsenal and be able to create uh, better, more pleasing images um, uh, as the outcome. So I will start uh, with vacation shots. Uh, I know it's May and vacation is just around the corner, um, but this is a winter shot, yes, but uh, this is actually the last vacation that I took, which was back in the uh, Northern Islands of Japan in Hokkaido. And for anybody who's actually been there, this is a very popular view. It's a very popular destination, especially for photographers, because we like to take pictures of wildlife. And in this case, it's the Japanese red crown cranes. You may not be able to see them clearly because they're really small. And this is actually a very small bunch. And they're actually located right here. Usually there's hundreds of them. Uh, but when I went in the morning, there was only a handful of them, unfortunately. But uh, I was still able to get some nice views um, uh, from this perspective. And where am I? I'm actually standing on a bridge, no more than about 40 meters wide. And uh, this is looking down the river, um, probably, oh, I don't know how far down, but it's pretty far because this is using about a 700 millimeter telephoto lens. Um, but this is fine. The view is great. But what you don't see is uh, what's happening around me. And most of you might be pretty familiar with this scenario. You go to a tourist location and you see all these photographers and tourists bunched up from shoulder to shoulder taking pictures of the same thing down that riverbank. And you see in the far distance there, there's even a tour bus that actually drops tourists and photographers to this destination. So you can see this bridge about 40 meters in wide and all the photographers are lined up and they're pretty much getting the same shots down that riverbank. Um, so I thought to myself, what can I do to be different? I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do in this case uh, other than move around from left to the right of the bridge. And that's exactly what I did. So when uh, many of the photographers left, I actually uh, picked up my tripod and camera and moved over to the far edge of the corner, uh, far edge of the bridge. And I noticed that these red crown cranes actually flew a lot closer to the bridge than before. So I managed to get this particular shot, uh, which is a much nicer and much more detailed shot of the red crown cranes. And it's one that uh, not many other photographers managed to get because they all left uh, before the cranes actually flew in a lot closer. Where did these photographers go? Well, they actually went here to the next destination, which is the feeding grounds of the red crown cranes. And uh, this is uh, obviously another popular photographer's destination or tourist destination. And you can see here um, from all the way to the left hand side of the, the fence, all the way to the right hand side, there are a bunch of photographers and particularly on the left hand side, that actually is a very large crowd. Uh, so when we go to a destination, our first instinct is actually going towards the crowd is because if there's a big crowd, there must be something happening there, right? Well, that's fine. You can go there, but after, um, but in essence, you're basically just going there and taking the same shot as everyone else there. So I do urge and I do recommend everybody to be conscious of your surroundings and be aware of where you're able to move around. And I encourage people to move around. And in this case, I can move around a lot more than uh, I could on the bridge itself. And uh, this is a very um, key point here because just by moving from the left hand to the right hand side, you can see that there's a little bit of a slope of a hill. Um, I have um, the left-hand side, there's a bunch of photographers there uh, with the trees in the backdrop. And on the right-hand side, you can actually see there are 
uh, is on top of a hill. So you get a completely different vantage point. Like you see here with the left hand side, the red crown cranes are back uh, by a nice forest in the background. And on the right hand side, if I move over, I can see what's on behind on the other side of the hill. And I can see actually the red crown cranes coming in for a landing and actually going, uh, taking off for a flight as well. So two completely different vantage points just because I moved around from left to the right of the uh, field. And it's something that not many people actually did because um, I noticed that when we do go to a destination and we photograph, we're always focused on what is right in front of ourselves, always focused on what our lens is pointed at, and we really don't care what's around ourselves. But I want us to be more conscious of our surroundings and be aware that you are able to move around and get different vantage points. And because of that, you're able to get different types of shots as well. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to get a little bit more variety in your portfolio. Uh, another thing that we can actually do is this case, I took a video, in this case, it's a slow motion video that I took with the Nikon Z7. And uh, we have to remind ourselves that um, the, uh, most of our cameras nowadays are actually capable of taking really nice video and slow motion video for some of it as well. So uh, do take advantage of the features that you have in your gear. And in this case, I did, this was actually handheld. Um, so it's a little bit uh, jerky in some cases, but I managed to get uh, slow motion behavior shots and uh, walking shots, which actually show a little bit of a different perspective of the subject matter. And it shows behaviors and movements that you won't uh, be able to actually achieve with just a single image. So I do encourage you to experiment with your gear and make sure, um, make full advantage of the gear that you do have. So I start off this slide with a quote and it's actually one of my favorite quotes here. A good photograph is knowing where to stand. And I firmly uh, stand by behind this quote as well. And this was actually sent by none other than uh, Ansel Adams, a great landscape photographer. Uh, this picture you see here is actually a picture of a popular oak trees in Japan in the Northern Islands uh, of Hokkaido. Uh, it's nicknamed parrot and child because the two parrot uh, oak trees standing um, act like they are guarding the child oak tree in the middle. Um, so I took this picture here, not very interesting, not very uh, special in it by any means. And um, so I moved back, I, I zoomed back a little bit and now I have this uh, vantage point where I have a huge open space here. The oak trees are now centered right in the middle and you see the sloping lines on either side uh, that have, um, that act as a leading line element. And I noticed that I placed the oak trees on the bottom half of the frame so I get more of the sky as well. It's a great image, um, but you know, nothing too spectacular by any means, um, but it's a nice minimal image that I was trying to get. But then I moved actually about 20 meters to my right or 20 feet to my right rather. And I noticed that I was able to get two different levels of the hill here. And uh, this was actually something uh, that I didn't see before when I was uh, 20 feet to my left. So I'm actually happy that I uh, walked all the way to the right-hand side. I managed to get the two different levels of the hill and those levels now act as a leading line element to the oak trees on the, on the top left corner of my frame. And this time I actually framed the uh, oak trees on the, on the top half of my frame so that I get uh, all snow on the bottom half of the frame. Similarly, I actually now moved uh, about 40 feet to my left and now I have one uh, level of the hill, but I actually have that level now as a leading line element straight towards my oak trees. And again, I left the entire bottom half completely filled with white and snow just to keep it at minimal uh, photograph, which is, what, which is what I was aiming for in this case. So a fairly different view, a little bit different than uh, having my subject matter smack in the middle of the view itself. Now uh, I wanted to get something completely different so I actually 
I drove around the the oak trees and I managed to capture one of my favorite shots actually of the oak trees here because this is a vantage point that I've never seen before are these oak trees. Uh, this may actually look like two different uh, images that are stacked on top of each other, but in fact, it's actually just one image just layered upon layers of nature. Uh, on the bottom half, you have the snow hill, and then you have a line of trees above that. And then behind that line of trees, you have another layer of snow. Uh, and uh, above that hill is the oak trees that I was photographing before. And it just so happened that it was overcast that day. So now I have uh, the clouds that act as uh, very uh, complementary to the white snow as well. So overall, I was very happy with this image because it's something that I've never seen before. It's a very new vantage point for these oak trees, uh, especially in the winter time. And I'm glad that I was able to capture it just because I was curious enough to drive all around the oak trees to see what I can find. So what's unique about the location? So this is actually the question that I ask myself every time I go to a new destination or if I photograph events um, in the cities, uh, which is what I do uh, a lot of the times. Um, what's unique about the location? And once I find that uniqueness, I try and incorporate that to my photos. And by doing that, I'm able to get something of interest in the photos and Hopefully I'm able to get something that is a little bit different than what everybody else uh, tries to get, uh, which may be a simple snapshot without uh, intentionally including elements in your photos. So, so in this case here, I'm a little bit closer to home now. I'm at High Park during a cherry blossom season that was last year. Uh, uh, my main focus is uh, the cherry blossoms because that's unique to the season. So I wanted to capture the cherry blossoms and all their beauty here. So I uh, angled myself so that uh, the cherry blossoms are there and I had the pathway leading from the right to the left here. But you know, there's a huge crowd of people as always. And um, this was actually very distracting. It, um, it just wasn't doing it for me. And I wasn't happy because, because of these, uh, the huge crowd of people, it actually lost focus. Uh, I wasn't actually after I looked at the image, I wasn't actually sure what my main focus was anymore because the cherry blossoms are now distracted by the number of people there. So what could I do to be different about this photo? Well, I looked around and I noticed that uh, every now and then a train actually comes through this pathway and a train that carries people throughout the high park. So when that train actually came, I ran right in front of the train. Yes, I did. And uh, I took pictures of, this, of the train actually going down that pathway under the canopy of cherry blossoms because I knew that the people would actually be dispersed away from in front of the train. So I intentionally got in front of it and uh, took as many pictures as I could before it, the train actually came to me. And it actually turned out well. Uh, without the distracting people, now they're, on, now they're actually uh, just out on the side and I get the main focus, which is the cherry blossoms and the train itself. Then I thought to myself, well, what else can I do to take pictures of the cherry blossoms? I looked around and I noticed uh, all these birds flying around. So I aimed my camera on top uh, or above myself and I got pictures of uh, birds basically. And I noticed that the birds were playing with the cherry blossoms, the petals, they were picking them out and they were actually dropping them to the ground and they were uh, licking the nectar from them and they were overall just having fun within the trees itself. So I ended up getting various birds um, playing around in the cherry blossoms and various types of birds as well, like this hummingbird here and uh, basically doing all sorts of different things. And I managed to get a whole collection of a, uh, birds inside the cherry blossoms. And I was actually very happy with this series because it's not something that you normally do get to see. It's not something that I actually uh, take. Um, birds is a different uh, subject matter for me. So I was actually happy that I was able to get uh, different types of birds in different uh, action scenes, enjoying the cherry blossoms, which was my main focus at that time. So I mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier, but horizon placement, uh, depending on where you place the horizon in your image, will actually change the type of uh, feel you get for the image. And what do I mean by this? Well, in this case, 
I have the horizon right smack in the middle of my image. You see here, there's a nice balance from whatever's on the top to whatever's on the bottom here. And in this case, it's the sky and the water down below. Uh, there's a nice balance, a very symmetrical feel to this, which is pretty much what I was going for because of the serenity or the sereneness of that moment. Conversely, if I were to put the horizon on the top, what you do is you basically get more of in the foreground. And in this case, it's the water. This makes me feel like I'm actually a lot closer to the foreground element, uh, which, in, which in this case is the water. It makes me feel like I'm actually right there in front of the water or possibly even on top of the water itself. Um, and what do I get when I get the horizon down on the bottom third of the image? Well, in this case, uh, you get more of the sky. And this makes us feel more uh, spaciousness uh, in the image, more expansive. And uh, because you get that open sky with no distracting elements, you get less of the foreground uh, uh, element as well. So basically three different, uh, completely different feel to the image uh, with three different uh, images based on how I angled my camera and whether it was a further uh, up in the middle or down below. Um, you get three different images. And I use this example of the horizon uh, with a landscape image, but this works completely the same way as long as you have some sort of horizon inside uh, your image, uh, whether it's in a cityscape, uh, if you have some sort of horizontal element, you can uh, place that anywhere in the frame and you'll see how different that looks uh, depending on where you have that foreground element or the, or the uh, background element placed. So I do encourage you to try different scenarios uh, the next time you do go out shoot as well. So this example here uh, of Niagara Falls, uh, everyone's favorite tourist attraction and very photogenic at that. So I don't blame them. I love this as well. Niagara Falls is uh, always a favorite for everyone. So in this case, I took a picture of Niagara Falls at the ledge here, which is uh, basically placed right in front of the uh, wrap around of the Horseshoe Falls. So it's a very common area, very accessible by many tourists and photo, uh, photographers. Uh, so I managed to get the sun rising actually right above the Horseshoe Falls. Uh, so it's a very popular uh, angle for many photographers. So uh, basically I'm trying to think to myself, what can I do to differentiate my pictures from everyone else's? So I look around and then I move a little bit further back uh, and in this case, on the top right-hand corner, you see that's the ledge that I was actually standing uh, to get the picture beforehand. And now I have a different vantage point of the Niagara Falls, the Horseshoe Falls here. Um, with a, a little bit of long exposure, I made the water silky smooth, which is what I like to do. And on the bottom right-hand corner, you see the little hut there for a journey behind the falls. Uh, so you get this complete picture here, which is uh, why everyone loves uh, this view. Um, and uh, what uh, other people actually like to do as well is to, to concentrate on that little hut that I mentioned there. And this time I took my telephoto lens here and aimed it at this hut, uh, which happened to have that light on uh, just that morning. So I managed to get that light on, but it's frozen. Otherwise, uh, the icicles um, on the roof, the, uh, the snow right on the platform there with the uh, waterfall, on the top left hand corner there. Um, so it's a beautiful image, uh, but again, a very popular one at that. You see many photographers do the same thing, uh, perhaps a little bit of a different composition, but more or less the same um, uh, uh, idea of focusing on the, on the hut. So what else can I do to be a little bit different? I moved around even more and this time I concentrated on the sunrise itself. I focused on the sun, and um, the Horseshoe Falls is actually right in the bottom half of the image there, falling into the shadows. So what I did here was I actually concentrated on the Niagara River itself because I noticed that uh, most people don't actually concentrate on the river itself. They more or less tend to focus on the, the falls itself. And then in this case, the steam rising from the river itself acted uh, really uh, as an interesting element as well because it's not something that uh, you do see, and then it actually gives context to where I am and how cold it was that morning. It was actually very cold. 
Uh, the next thing I did was I looked around and I saw a very sliver of the horseshoe falls lit up by the sunlight. So I concentrated my, uh, my focus around that area and I managed to, uh, I intentionally left a little bit of the river in the background as well. So you can see the steam rising above the river. Uh, so you get a, a feel as to where this is. So this is the Niagara, uh, Niagara Falls with the river in the background. And again, it's another long exposure because I wanted to uh, get that uh, silky smooth uh, smoothness of the waterfall itself. So again, what else can I do to be a little bit more different? Uh, I looked, uh, this time I looked right below myself and I saw the rushing water of the, of the raging Niagara River. And uh, I played around with this. I did a semi-long exposure and I managed to get a completely different texture uh, of the river itself than what I had before, with, which was silky smooth. And this is why I like this, because uh, I get a very contrasting feel to this image. The, the water is now seen as more of a, a steel wool type of texture or fabric, uh, which is a very contrasting um, thought to what you might think a water might be like. So this is something a little bit different than I, that I was happy with. Um, and then on my way back, I actually looked around and I saw this, which was which actually turned out to be probably my favorite shot of that morning. And uh, you may ask yourself, well, where is this? This is in fact the U.S. side of the Niagara Falls, and uh, it's, it actually turned out really well because um, the sun was shining behind the trees, the hoarfrost on the trees, and the snow, and the ice around, surrounding the waterfall. Again, this was a, a long exposure to make this a more ethereal, surreal, and a dreamy feel to the image, and it's something that I really liked. Um, so those past six images that I took of the Niagara Falls, basically I snuck in a storytelling element. So what do I mean by storytelling element? You basically tell a story through a series of images. So one story on top, another story in the bottom here. And the first uh, story, for the first frame I used in what is called an establishing shot. This basically tells the viewers uh, the context of where your images or your stories is set. So it's a uh, more uh, a wide angle shot of the image itself. And then the second photo, we had the mid range where we focus on a select element of the uh, wide angle shot. And in, in this case, it's a waterfall. And in the final image of the series, you have a close up or a detailed shot, which basically focuses uh, more on an action or a detail of, the, of a specific uh, element inside your mid range shot. So, by using three different uh, perspectives, you get a whole series of photos that are tied one with the other, and you get to be able to tell a different story because of that. So it's a different way of thinking, uh, and it's a different way of, of being able to tie your images one with the other. Uh, eye level, or which level, and this is something that uh, many people can do with their cameras or mobile phones, and it, it's the easiest thing that we can do, and basically it gives a completely different feel to our images. When we go to a section, we often think uh, to basically hold our camera at eye level, which is completely natural and, and it's fine to do. But when we do that, we actually tend to look at our subject uh, from a top point of view looking downwards, which is a bit, a bit of an authoritative view, uh, a view which acts um, maybe feels like we're towering above our subject matter. And it's not something that we uh, always want to do. So in this case uh, of the swans, I'm looking from above and I'm looking uh, down below the swans. But in this case, what I wanted to do was get more intimate with the my subject matter. So uh, in this particular view, I took a picture with the camera right above the waterline. And now I feel like I'm there right with the waterfowls itself. Uh, I feel a more intimate, more, um, I'm, I'm actually right there with the subject matter. So whether you're taking pictures of ducks like this, uh, maybe you have pets running around at home or your children running at, around at home, um, don't uh, instinctively just stand there and take photos, go to their eye level, shrug down and use that LCD viewfinder that you have on your cameras. Or in, in the case of your mobile phone, your entire phone is actually your viewfinder. So you can actually see this really well. So uh, do take advantage of that and point your camera right down to the ground and uh, shoot at the eye level of your, of your subject matter. You'll get a drastically different uh, point of view and feel to your overall images. Foreground or not to foreground. 
As a landscape photographer, you ask like five different uh, landscapes this question, you may get five different answers. Many people will say you do need a foreground element to make a landscape work, uh, but I tend to disagree with that. I like the simplicity and the uh, natural element of a balanced image just like this with no foreground elements. Uh, I have the horizon right in the middle of this uh, frame again and with no distractions uh, on the top or the bottom. Uh, what people tend to say with foregrounds is it does two things. It actually acts as a leading line element to our image and it uh, gives a sense of depth to our image because you do have something in the foreground uh, and, and that's relative to what is in the background. So in this case here, I have the ice in the foreground, which if you follow with your eyes, it naturally leads your eyes right to the, uh, the duck flapping its wings in the middle. And if you follow the ice pack again, or the duck pack right to the right hand side, your, your eye naturally goes to the skyline and the CN tower. And this is basically what you want your viewers to do. In the eyes of the viewers, you want them to naturally move all around your image. And that makes it for a more uh, attractive image, more impactful image, uh, just by placing your foreground in specific ways and uh, using your foreground to the advantage. So again, foreground element uh, included if you are able to, but don't always think that you must have a foreground element inside your landscape images. Toronto Sunrise series. Uh, so for those of you who follow me on Instagram, thank you very much. You may know that I have my own personal series here. It's called the Toronto Sunrise Series. The personal project of mine that I started back in 2014. So this is actually my seventh year doing it. Uh, and it's basically this. I just go out on the lake shore. I take my camera with me and I try and take pictures of the sun rising above the horizon. Uh, so I managed to get a very huge collection of nice Toronto sunrises, uh, which I'll show you here in the next two slides. A nice serene element here, which is a very subtle pink hue with the sun rising slightly behind the buildings there. I love this moment. It gives it a nice peaceful moment. Um, but then I get different uh, vibrant moments like this, where the orange and the, and the red in the sky is actually burning away with the sunlight. And it's a very powerful and uh, invigorating moment, moment as well. And at the same time, I do get lucky with different um, weather phenomena as well. In this case, the fog started rolling around very heavily and it actually covered the entire city skyline. I managed to cover the, the fog, uh, which is a very uh, rare thing that you, you get to see. And you don't get to see these things until you, uh, you keep going and going and going as well. Um, and many people have asked me, you've gone for so many years, do you ever get bored of actually going back to the park and taking pictures of the same thing over and over again? And to that I say, well, no, because I basically think differently every time I go. I think to myself, what can I do to change things up a bit? What can I include? Where can I go to see different things and incorporate different things into my pictures? Well, in this case, I incorporated the iconic Humber Bay Bridge, uh, just the bottom of it, though not the entire bridge, and I still um, wanted to focus on the Toronto as well. So I um, put myself into a viewpoint where I can see the Toronto skyline and the bridge itself. And I actually waited for a pedestrian to walk by or ride by on their bicycle. And I intentionally blurred them to give that sense of movement in the image itself. Uh, and in this case here, when I came to this, uh, the scene, I noticed that there are two people there exercising in the, uh, on the far distance there. And at first I thought to myself, well, they're gonna be in, in the way of my image. I wasn't happy with them there, but then as the sun started rising, I noticed that they were actually standing still right apart from each other. So I just moved over to my left-hand side to frame the sun rising right in between the two. And I managed to get this shot, which is uh, something that I'm very happy with. And that I was able to play with silhouettes at this point. And uh, this time I, I went at different moments in uh, the year where I knew where the sun was uh, about to rise. So I managed to get this, uh, plan my shots with the app, with an app, and I managed to get the picture with the sun rising right behind the CN Tower. So you get to do different things. You get to, to go at different seasons as well. And in this case, uh, during the snowstorm of 2017, I found this branch overhanging above the rocks there and it was completely frozen everywhere. So I framed the city skyline in between the, the, uh, the snow and the rocks um, and the branch. And then I managed to get this beautiful sunrise as well. 
So you basically just keep going and going uh, and you start to think differently and you start to think like a photographer uh, and you start to do different things. Uh, and this one last shot here is uh, black and white, which many people will know that I don't do too often because I do love color. But again, if you shoot in black and white, you start to think differently because in black and white, you now have to concentrate on the texture, the lighting, and the uh, um, and the uh, the curve. Uh, sorry, the texture and the lighting um, in the in the scene. So you not you may not normally do this when uh, you're shooting in color, but it's an added element that you do need to shoot. Uh, you need to consider for when you're shooting in black and white. And it's always something, uh, a different mindset that you're thinking of uh, when you're shooting in black and white. So it's a great exercise to be able to do this. Um, and it's the, the one last exercise that I actually tell a lot of people to do is basically, uh, if you want to start thinking differently, take a, an object inside your home, inside uh, maybe in your backyard or something, and shoot that one object 20 different times. And then you'll get uh, to think creatively. You'll get to show different aspects of that one object and you might actually be able to move them around, compose them differently. And uh, with that, you start to think uh, creatively, think a little bit outside the box. And uh, hopefully when you get out there into the field, you'll incorporate all these elements uh, within your picture taking. And soon enough, when you do them over and over again, uh, these things will actually become second nature to you so that when you do go out onto your location, uh, you'll naturally think to place that horizon at a certain level. You'll naturally think to have including uh, and to include that foreground element, or you'll naturally think to uh, do certain things and uh, put your camera at certain perspectives and uh, levels to better increase the impact of your final image. Um, and with that, I hope uh, you gained a few tips and tricks um, uh, that you can try with uh, your camera, whether you have a DSLR or your mobile phone. And I thank you for listening. And uh, my website is there. Uh, if you want to uh, see more of my images and uh, if you need to contact me for uh, any questions or advice, I'm always happy to uh, hear them from you. And you can always follow me on Instagram at smaku, S-M-A-K-U. So thanks a lot for coming and uh, hope you enjoy the day and keep shooting.